uh, trainings. Uh, and our next forum uh, will be on May 10th, uh, also uh, in the Mackinac Room uh, over lunch. Uh, and uh, I believe we will be talking about uh, refugee settlement uh, in relationship to Ukraine. So uh, hopefully you can continue to, to join us and we look forward uh, to seeing you in person. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce uh, for today's panel, uh, uh, Arnold Weinfeld, our Associate Director. Thanks, Matt. Uh, appreciate that introduction. And thanks to everyone for being with us here today, uh, as Matt noted, hopefully for the last time on Zoom, uh, to uh, provide you some information on the Michigan State budget that's being discussed right now and uh, some of the tax cut proposals that are being discussed uh, hand in hand. Uh, with us today, uh, we have Robert Schneider, who is a Senior Research Associate for State Affairs with the Citizens Research Council of Michigan, Rachel Richards, a Fiscal Policy Director for the Michigan League for Public Policy, James Holman, Director of Fiscal Policy for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, and Janelle Kamenga, a Policy Analyst for the Tax Foundation. And uh, let's get right into it. Uh, Bob, I think uh, you're up first. Thank you, Arnold. I'm going to share my screen here. So just give me a short moment. Hopefully everyone is now seeing my screen. Looks good, thanks. Good, so thank you Arnold and good afternoon everyone. Happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna kick things off with a quick review of how some of the tax relief proposals that have been floated here in Lansing um, fit into the state's long-term budget outlook. So just like new spending tax relief isn't free, there are trade-offs to be made. And I'm hoping today's overview will put some parameters on, on what those trade-offs uh, what those trade-offs look like. Let's, I'm going to start with a quick review of the state's revenue picture and how the state finds itself with really unprecedented revenue surpluses at the moment uh, that will factor into this discussion. Obviously, um, uh, certainly higher than I can recall in my uh, you know 25 or so years monitoring the state budget. So the, the most recent January 2022 consensus revenue forecast really capped off a, a crazy couple years for uh, the revenue forecasters involved in that process for the fourth straight time. Um, revenues uh, rose significantly, the forecast rose significantly. This, this slide outlines the progression of those forecasts, general fund on the left, school aid fund on the right for fiscal year 2022. So and it starts in the dark blue bar uh, on the left with the January 2020 forecast pre-COVID and then moves through the next five forecasts through the last one in January. Note two things, when COVID struck in early 2020, the, for, uh, the revenue forecast plummeted by $2.1 billion across both those funds. Um, it, but then in, by the last forecast uh, in January of 2022, the, the forecasts are now $2.4 billion above the pre-pandemic uh, pre level. So what happened? I think a, a few things are of note, a quicker recovery, I think, from the pandemic slowdown, a very strong sales tax growth tied to a shifts in spending on goods, which are taxable under the sales tax versus services that are not. And I most of all, a whole ton of federal stimulus, the COVID tax refunds, uh, enhanced unemployment benefits, paycheck protection program, all helping to drive up uh, spendable income spending and thus the, those state revenues as well. Um, that changing scenario has resulted in huge revenue surpluses for the state. Uh, when things looked dire in, in uh, 2020, there was a lot of budget cutting and a lot of fund shifting done um, to sort of live within what was expected to be the new means. Uh, we were preparing for a revenue downturn that never really came. And not only did it not come, um, but we, we saw revenue start to boom, um, which gives us this $4.3 billion in, in general fund surplus at the close of fiscal year 21 and, and $2.9 million in our school aid fund, the two major revenue funds for the state. So that's effectively a lot of one-time money in the bank um, for the state that's available. It, it, further, since revenue growth also looks strong, there's room to tap into more revenue, not just on a one-time basis, but on a permanent basis. Um, this chart looks at the general fund on top, school aid fund on the bottom, and it compares projected revenues with 
baseline spending. And by baseline spending, I mean everything we're already doing in the budget, nothing new. What do we, what do we need to maintain the current budget given inflationary cost pressures and so forth uh, that, that, that's happening? Um, so effectively, this, this table shows, you know, we have room in the general fund budget for probably about another billion dollars in new general fund resources long term. Uh, and over $2 billion, since re revenues are exceeding spending on the school aid fund side for, uh, for ongoing um, enhancements. And that can be spending or it can be tax relief, you know, giving some of that revenue back, um, back to the taxpayers. So uh, big gaps between spending and revenue that open up avenues for, uh, for either spending or, or tax relief enhancements. Um, that's a lot of good news on budget resources, but then before we, before I started on the tax proposals, I thought a quick history lesson might be in order uh, to give some historical perspective. Remember, we are just climbing out of a pretty sizable budget hole uh, on the general fund side. This chart shows general fund actual revenue, top line, um, inflation adjusted general fund revenue on the bottom line. Either the first decade of this new century was not a nice one for Michigan. Uh, we saw employment losses during that dec decade, pretty slow income growth, you know, those economic factors, in addition to tax policy changes that were implemented during that time period, resulted in a pretty dramatic drop off on the general fund side. Um, and if you know, you know, I, I, I note two things. If you look at fiscal year 2020, um, general fund revenue in, in fiscal year 2020 of $10.8 billion is basically back at the level that it was 20 years before in fiscal year 20, uh, fiscal year 2000 at 10.7 billion. And if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom line and an inflation adjusted uh, general fund revenue, even with the growth that's projected and it's pretty robust, um, by 2024, we'd still be about 22% down um, in terms of general fund uh, revenue adjusted for inflation. So um, lots of good news right now, but uh, recall we are, we are still, uh, you know, just kind of emerging from, uh, from the hole that was created in that first uh, 10 years of the new century. So, so with that, let's turn to some of the recent tax policy proposals, and we'll start with the governor's proposal uh, included in her February budget recommendation. The governor chose to allocate some significant revenue to tax relief, and her goal was to repeal two major tax policy changes implemented in 2011 that were uh, part of a major restructuring of business taxation uh, that saw the repeal of the Michigan business tax at that time and its replacement with a new corporate income tax. Both of the changes the governor is addressing were sort of revenue raisers to kind of help, help offset the, the revenue declines um, tied to the business, uh, the business tax restructuring. One policy change implemented then was the reduction in the state's earned income tax credit. I know we'll hear more about that later. Uh, but the governor is proposing restoring the credit uh, before the before 2011. It was pegged at 20 percent of an existing federal earned, earned income tax credit. The 2011 changes reduced that to six percent. Um, the governor's proposal was to restore it back to 20 per, uh, 20 percent of the federal credit. Long term, that means the income tax revenues decline by around 270 million dollars um, on, on a permanent basis. Uh, and then secondly, the other major change proposed by the governor is a repeal of uh, changes to the taxation of retirement income. So recall in 2011, um, the, the legislation enacted at that time eliminated income tax, the income tax exemption for public pensions. And it also um, eliminated fairly generous exemption amounts for private pension income um, under the changes in the law. Um, no uh, retirement income, uh, pension, or uh, public or private retirement income come as exempt until age 67. And then at that point, there's a special uh, exemption against all income, $20,000 for a single filer, $40,000 for a joint filer. The governor's proposal is to phase back towards allowing retirees to operate under the old rules, pre-2011, and, and her proposal is to phase that in um, by one, the percentage of income exempted from the new rules, and then also by age. And once fully phased in, that uh, component of her proposal reduces general fund income by about a half billion dollars annually um, going forward. 
I, uh, I thought it, would, it, it might be useful to take a look at a few examples to show how this would work, uh, comparing the new rules under the uh, 2011 changes to the old rules that would phase back in under the governor's proposal. I'm going to look at a couple examples. I may skip one for, for time uh, purposes. Um, so this looks at a 60-year-old with a retiree with $40,000 in annual public pension. Again, 2011 changes under the new rules, no special exemption anymore for, for, for that public pension income. Um, since this person's 60, uh, they wouldn't be eligible in tax year 2022 or 2023 under the age um, phase in. But once 2024 hits, 75% uh, of that uh, public pension income would be exempt. And by 2025, it'd be back to the full old rules, 100% would, would be exempt. Um, I'm going to skip ahead one and, and talk about uh, a 69-year-old single retiree, this time with $50,000 in retirement income from a private pension. Since this person is 69, uh, they already are qualified for the $20,000 uh, exemption from all income that applies to them. That would include this, uh, this private retirement income. Under the phase-in, again, in, in tax year 2022, the person is age eligible, but since only 25% of the uh, of the old uh, favorable exemption is phased in, that only equates to $14,000. In all likelihood, this person is going to continue to opt into operating under the new rules. But once the 50%, 75%, 100% phase in is complete, um, this person would be able to exempt all of that private retirement income by tax year 2025. That, that exemption amount would uh, uh, would would uh, get back to sixty three thousand dollars more than the retirement income this person is is uh, is enjoying. So again, for retirees, uh, more favorable tax treatment for for that retirement income. And those couple of examples try to highlight that. Uh, so what does this mean for uh, what does the do the two combined proposals mean for the general fund revenue picture going forward? This chart quickly shows you know, this basically the governor's proposal would eat up about 63% of the projected revenue growth between fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2025 um, for the general fund. Instead of landing at 13.7 billion, we'd land uh, once those proposals, if those proposals are implemented at about $12.9 billion. So that's a significant amount of those available resources uh, that would uh, that would be uh, uh, spent effectively on, on, on that, that tax relief proposal. Um, looking bigger picture then, how, how do the governor's, what do the governor's tax proposals mean to the longer term budget outlook in future years? We look back at that same table we showed earlier for the general fund and looking at projected revenues and baseline spending. But now we add in uh, the governor's new proposals in red. So the revenue loss for her tax relief proposals on the top and then uh, on the bottom, um, the, uh, the spending proposals included in her February budget recommendation. Um, the governor included a lot of new one-time spending in fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23, and then about $410 million in ongoing general fund spending in, uh, in the out years, fiscal year 24 and beyond. So looking at the first two years in fiscal year 22 and 23, Spending exceeds revenue significantly. If you add up the two the numbers in those two blue sections there, they add up to $4.2 billion. Well, remember we said there was about $4.2 billion in general fund uh, surplus in the bank. Um, the governor's proposal would eat that up in 22 and 23. So no more money in the bank, but then looking into the out years in 24, fiscal year 24, fiscal year 25, uh, the the revenue growth helps pay for the phase in of the tax relief, and we're about balanced. Uh, revenues and spending are roughly equal, um, and uh, you know we we can maintain that four hundred and ten million dollars that the governor added to the budget. Key thing is no no real room now for any extra enhancements. We're back to kind of continuation budget. If you want so two hundred million dollars in new stuff in twenty four twenty five, it's going to have to be paid out of. Uh, uh, for cut somewhere else in the in the existing budget. Uh, real quick, I don't want to take too much time because I know I'm I'm going to be short on time here. Um, uh, we we did do a budget webinar. If you're interested in the spending side of this, uh, look on the CRC website. Boy, my mouse has an itchy trigger figure here, um, and you'll find a link to that uh, that uh, that 
that webinar uh, that'll give you more details on the spending proposals. So now let's turn to the former uh, formal legislative tax proposal that, as you may know, was recently vetoed by the governor. Uh, as negotiations go forward on tax policy, we'll see what elements of that plan might be resurrected in, in those discussions. Um, but Senate Bill uh, 768 was approved on March 2nd. It included a income tax rate cut, uh, as shown to 3.9%. It included some immediate relief instead of phasing in relief for retirement income. It, it uh, kind of went immediately and gave immediate uh, retirement income relief to those age 62 and over. And then it included a $500 per child um, non-refundable uh, tax credit. Uh, that was vetoed, of course, as, as most of you know, by the governor last Friday. Um, combined, those three elements would have uh, reduced long-term state revenue by about $2.5 billion. Um, and about 90% of that impact falls on the general fund side. So if we take a, a, another snapshot of the um, long-term state budget picture again and, and, uh, and add in the Senate bill uh, uh, 768 tax relief impact, we see in fiscal year 22 and 23, um, two things jump out basically. Um, one, you can't afford any additional spend in order to pay for the tax relief. You can't afford any additional spending increases. Those would have to fall by the wayside, but those are new spending increases. Um, you can get through fiscal year 23 without having to cut the, the core baseline budget anymore. But at the same time, if you add up the two blue numbers, they add up again to roughly $4.2 billion. So the, um, in, in 22 and 23, the revenue loss basically eats up the... Uh, eats up the, uh, the existing surplus uh, and um, uh, that money in the bank would again be gone. Where the rubber meets the road kind of with that full package is uh, since there's no more money left in the bank, you, you sort of create a, the, have a face of budget cliff starting in fiscal year 24. Um, baseline spending exceeds revenue by about $1.3 billion. That's about 10% of baseline general fund. You'd need to either cut the general fund budget by 10% or find other sources of revenue to, to sort of backfill uh, for, for that revenue loss. Uh, wanted to take a look, since I know we're going to be talking about the income tax, what if you just do the income tax rate cut? Um, then the picture changes. So now, um, once again, you, you can't afford any new ongoing spending, uh, as the governor proposed, about $400 million. But, um, uh, you know, the, the revenue losses exclusively from the income tax rate cut uh, eat up about $2 billion of the, uh, of the general fund uh, revenue surplus. That leaves about $2 billion. Theoretically, you could uh, carve out some one-time spending, uh, uh, either part of what the governor proposed or something that the legislature is interested in. You, you still have some room. And then long-term, you don't have that cliff anymore if you, if you just uh, limit the uh, uh, the, the uh, tax policy change to the tax rate, uh, income tax rate component of, of Senate Bill 768. Uh, and then I wanted to close and, and take a quick look at the sales tax holiday proposal um, that's now being floated. It appears all parties may be amenable to, um, to suspending the, uh, uh, the sales tax on gasoline for some limited time period. Just a, a quick analysis that I did, leaning heavily on the uh, House and Senate Fiscal Agency analysis of the gasoline tax suspension proposal. If gas prices remain in the four four dollar four dollar twenty five cent per gallon range, a six month suspension reduces revenue by about six hundred and fifty to seven hundred million dollars. Um, that has ramifications and implications on the school aid fund, the general fund. Um, there, there's an earmark for constitutional revenue sharing um, and for public uh, the comprehensive transportation fund that funds public transit. All of those are one time. All, all of those are one time hits to to, uh, to those pots. And um, so you'd have to find some ways to uh, limit one time spending. Um, but uh, for the school aid fund, there's very significant one-time spending being proposed by uh, the governor in fiscal year 22 and 23. You'd have to do without maybe three or $400 million of so that. Same on the general fund side is, is have, uh, have to do without some one-time spending. But this is, one this is a one-time revenue cut, so not an ongoing revenue cut. And um, uh, again, wouldn't have any kind of long-term budget implications uh, through the future. So 
I, I hope that was helpful. I know, I, I hope I didn't take up too much time. Questions were coming in. We can get to those later, Arnold, if, if there's time. And I'm gonna turn, the, given the time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Arnold. Thanks, Bob. Very informative, very straightforward. Greatly appreciate that. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in, uh, and I should have noted this on the front end. The chat and mute functions are turned off today because of the large size of our audience. So please use the Q&A box for questions. Um, before we get uh, to Rachel, we do have one question that's a follow-up uh, to one of your first slides, Bob. And that is, why is fiscal year 2024 inflation adjusted revenue still down from fiscal year 2000? What caused it? Can you help us put it into context? Might take a longer conversation about the Michigan economy and uh, its ups and downs, but uh, what, 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 is there a simple answer to that? Yeah, uh, it's a combination of, um, of the fact that we, uh, that we had a really, uh, sluggish and slow economy. We lost employment year over year pretty consistently through the first 10 years of the, uh, of the new century um, combined. And we also, uh, we also made tax policy changes uh, that, uh, that reduced general fund revenue. Um, and often uh, when we did tax policy changes, uh, you know, we held the, the Again, states, two major revenue funds, general fund, school aid fund. Um, when there were tax policy changes, we often also held the school aid fund harmless. Um, so the school aid fund sort of escaped the revenue bite um, from tax policy changes. It fell on the, uh, you know, which means all of the revenue implications fell on the general fund. Um, that's what caused the actual revenues to decline. And even though we've had growth, um, we, you know, we just, on an inflation adjusted basis, haven't gotten back to where we were before. Right. We still haven't recovered from those disruptions yep. and the impacts on, on the budget. Well, again, Bob, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have more questions along the way. Uh, let's turn it over now to Rachel Richards from the Michigan League for Public Policy. Rachel will be discussing uh, the earned income tax credit proposal. Yep. Thank you, Arnold. Um, let me get my screen shared here as well. Um, Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yep, you're good. Okay, uh, so yeah, I am going to be talking about um, the Michigan Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a um, income tax credit that helps working families make ends meet and pay for essentials like utilities, groceries, and like vehicle maintenance and such. Um, you know, as a quick little bit of a background, um, the um, uh, the earned income tax credit is both a state and federal income tax credit. Um, uh, federally, it was signed into law by President Gerald Ford in 1975 as a temporary uh, tax credit, and it was made permanent a few years later. Um, and there's been several expansions at the federal level, notably in 1993, um, when it was first available um, to workers without children, and then again in 2021, which greatly expanded the, um, the credit for workers not raising kids. Um, Michigan, um, I'll say, you know, in terms of what is happening federally, um, about 25 million households receive about $60 billion worth of federal earned income tax credits. That's an average of about $2,400 um, that is put back into the pockets of working families. Um, the Michigan average is slightly higher than the national average at uh, $2,467 based on um, 2011 data or 2020 data. Um, and participation rates uh, nationwide, about one in five um, Michigan families that are eligible, one in five national families that are eligible for the federal earned income tax credit don't um, end up not claiming it for um, a number of reasons. Um, Michigan, our participation rate is, is slightly higher, but still about one in five Michigan families um, don't claim the, the credit to which they are um, eligible. Um, it's noted Michigan um, enacted its uh, state earned income tax credit in 2006. It was um, a equal of up to 20% of the federal credit at that time. Um, so to kind of give a, a rough example, if um, you know you're filling out your federal tax form and determined that you got about a thousand dollar federal earned income tax credit, a 20% state earned income tax credit would give you about a $200 state supplement. Um, 
as Bob noted in his presentation um, in 2011, as part of some of those budget balancing, um, you know, maneuvers that needed to happen, um, along with the tax reform legislation that that passed at the same time, the earned income tax credit was greatly slashed to six percent of the federal credit. Um, and what this meant was, that given that you know, thousand dollar federal earned income tax credit example. Uh, families are now looking at about a $60 state supplement with that. Um, we do see some significant ex uh, um, opportunities for improvement in 2022. Uh, as Bob noted, the governor proposed restoration of the credit to 20% of the federal credit. And um, Senator Wayne Schmidt actually has a bill um, in the state Senate, um, it's Senate Bill 417. It received a, a very positive hearing um, back in December. And that bill would actually increase the state earned income tax credit to up to 30% over, over a couple of years. So, um, you know, that uh, is, a, is a great improvement over what we currently have. Um, a little bit more on what the, um, you know, on how the, the earned income tax credit works. Uh, this applies kind of both federally and to the state. Um, our state credit strictly piggybacks off of and couples with the federal earned income tax credit. So, um, like I said, it's simply a percentage of, of that federal credit. Um, and really the IRS is what kind of uh, sets the rules and the calculations for the credits um, at the federal level. And then we just pick up a, a portion of, of that um, as a state supplement. Um, so the credit formula really, you know, is based on a number of factors, including, um, you know, uh, a family's earnings. Um, it would be earnings based off of either wage or salary earnings, um, self-employment earnings, or, you know, earnings from gig economy work. Um, you know, the number of kids that a uh, dependent children um, that a taxpayer has, um, the, you know, filers, mar marital status, um, age, and a number of these factors are adjusted for inflation each year. Um, one of the interesting things uh, with the earned income tax credit is that it phases in and it phases out. So a family that or a, a filer that is um, you know, earning very little um, would qualify for a very small credit. Um, and similarly, a filer that is at the kind of near the top of the income um, range would receive a very uh, a very small credit. So most of the, the benefits are actually bundled um, towards the middle of, of those, um, those income ranges. Um, so really as you know, folks are, are earning more, you're actually seeing that credit grow a little bit. And then once it plateaus, um, as you earn a little bit more, you don't have a precipitous drop, but it slowly phases out over the next um, several, you know, over, over the income. Um, so as I noted earlier, states can supplement the federal earned income tax credit by enacting their own state credits. Um, and about 31 states plus Washington DC and Puerto Rico have enacted state level earned income tax credits. The most recent um, have been Missouri enacted their state earned income tax credit in 2021. It'll be effective starting 2023. And Utah enacted um, a state earned income tax credit in 2022, which will be effective in 2023. Washington State, um, they actually enacted their state earned income tax credit in 2008, um, but uh, it was only recently um, funded um, for the first time. So. Um, and then there's, there is wide variation among states with state level earned income tax credits. Um, so of the 31 states and DC that have an earned income tax credit, only six of them are actually non-refundable. Um, and that's Hawaii, Missouri, Ohio, South Carolina, Utah, and Virginia. Um, Delaware and Maryland have both a refundable and non-refundable component, um, but taxpayers need to choose one or the other in terms of, of what you know, works best for their, um, their own tax situation. Um, and they, there is a, a very broad range in terms of the, the credits that it, states have enacted. We have with them as low as 3% of the federal credit at, uh, in terms of Montana. Um, and then a couple of states and DC have also, um, are also allowing uh, credits of up to 100% of the federal credit. Um, you know, for, for workers that don't have dependent children, for example, or a non-refundable credit of up to 100% of the federal credit. 
Um, there are a couple of states that have actually decoupled from the federal credit. Um, you know, they set their own income um, or credit calculation parameters. Um, a couple of those are California and Minnesota, for example. So of, you know, states in the Midwest, Michigan has the lowest credit at 6% of the federal credit. Um, Indiana's is 9%, Illinois is at 18 and Ohio is at 30%. Um, so I'll say that the earned income tax credit has a, a very um, strong impact on the filer, uh, the families that receive it, as well as on the local economies as families that receive the credit do tend to spend their credits locally um, at their you know, grocery stores, their hardware stores, um, auto body repair shops and whatnot. Um, at the current rate, the average earned income tax credit based on tax year 2019 data is about $150. Um, and that puts about $110 million back into our local economies. Um, if the credit were restored under the governor's proposal, um, that $150 looks more like $500. Um, and then if it were expanded as under the Senator Schmidt proposal, it's about $750. Um, and that's uh, you know, up to about $550 million back into our local economies at that 30% level. So based on revenue projections that were done back in January, uh, we believe that a boost to 20 or even 30% of the federal credit is not only reasonable and provides you know, significant value for recipients and their local economies, but it's also responsible and sustainable in the long term. It won't put the state at risk for returning vital federal aid, um, nor will it hinder abilities to make uh, their needed investments as we've disinvested in you know, state government um, and state services for, for so long. Um, so the EITC uh, has a very significant impact on families. Um, it does help workers make ends meet um, by allowing them to keep up with the rising costs of essentials such as groceries and transportation and childcare while remaining in the workforce. Um, the EITC also has very positive long lasting effects for children, including better health. Um, kids that receive it tend to do better and go further in school and have increased earnings into adulthood simply because of the post tax um, income boost that they receive from the earned income tax credit. The EITC, the state um, and federal EITC also helps support equity um, statewide and does reduce poverty in communities across the state. Um, in terms of racial equity, it does um, really help support racial equity in the state as uh, families of color do make up a greater share of households with low incomes um, due to a history of racial bias and discrimination um, and um, historical and systemic barriers to opportunity and advancement. Um, the a couple of additional points, um, the earned income tax credit um, does, you know, research has shown that it does have, um, the federal credit does have a positive association with workforce participation, especially for, for unmarried mothers. Um, and then it doesn't, as I noted before, it doesn't have a cliff effect as recipients can continue to benefit as hours and earnings increase. Um, you know, uh, one of the issues that we hear is that the state credit doesn't go as far as the federal credit. Um, so, but for those that are, you know, really on the, um, really struggling to make ends meet and, you know, kind of on the verge of um, falling into poverty, you know, the $150 that they're receiving right now does actually go farther, uh, does actually go far. Um, but we do think it could, you know, definitely go further, especially if we boost it to the 30% under the Senator Schmidt bill. Um, at the 30%, that $750 means, you know, 10 months of internet access as we just, you know, kind of came out of COVID and everybody was, you know, either working from home and schooling from home as it was in my family, you know, having safe, or uh, uh, secure, reliable, um, fast, high speed internet access was really important. It also could mean, you know, nine months of diapers or like a month of childcare to keep a, a family within the workforce. Um, another one, I just kind of want to head this off. Um, one of the, the issues that we hear with the earned income tax credit is fraud. Um, and really what I want to highlight it is that these are, it's really more about understanding kind of some of the improper payments that could be made, both in terms of 
overpayments, um, which was a, a focus of a um, Congressional Budget Office report over or almost a decade ago, um, as well as some of those underpayments or non-payments for folks that are eligible but um, but don't re, don't claim it for for whatever reason. Um, over the last decade, the IRS has taken steps to reduce earned income tax errors of paid preparers. And a couple of things that we could potentially do um, to really help with, uh, with these overpayments is one, provide some increased federal funding for the IRS to make sure that they have capacity to do the work that they need to do. Um, we know that over the past decade, uh, the IRS has seen about a 20% decrease in full-time equivalent positions. Um, we also could do some support for our IRS trained volunteer income tax assistance sites um, that, uh, you know, do provide uh, free, um, high quality income tax preparation services for families with low to moderate incomes. These are, are IRS trained folks that are, are meant to be looking at these credits um, and making sure that they are um, claimed properly. Oh, um, a couple of our um, resources for folks that we have a, a lot of good information on our website, mlpp.org. Um, there's also a number of, of sites that folks could look at uh, to get some more information about uh, VITA sites statewide. Um, with that, I have my contact information up. I have also provided the contact information for Ian Cunin, who is the league's uh, great tax policy analyst, who is also very um, involved and very knowledgeable. Thank you very much, Rachel. Really appreciate that presentation on the EITC and uh, what uh, an increased benefits might mean to the average citizen as well as to the state of Michigan. Um, we have had one question, and I think Bob just answered it uh, through the chat, so you can see that there. Um, uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, James Holman from the Mackinac Center to talk about the income tax rate cut. Uh, the benefits of that uh, proposal. James? Hello. And I actually want to thank, um, uh, thank Rachel and Bob for covering a lot of stuff that I'm already going to cover so I can truncate this and you know, get us back on, on schedule. Um, so uh, like Bob, before I get into the question of taxes, I want to talk about Michigan's budget because the biggest objection to any tax policy discussion is whether the state budget can afford it. Uh, budgets are always, uh, tax, uh, tax and budget priorities are all about prioritization. We only have limited revenues and we have priorities. And so uh, lawmakers have had just a lot more resources to work with over the past decade. State spending, so not including the federal uh, resources, has increased from around $27.3 billion to $39.1 billion over the past 10 years. That's a 20% increase above inflation. And lawmakers have used this to accomplish some of their priorities. We've gotten the roads back roughly to the point where they're being put together uh, as quickly as they fall apart. So here are the projections for road quality. It's the most expansive measure that we've got. It's not all the roads. Most uh, roads don't get rated. But as you can see in 2010, they thought roads were going to fall apart precipitously. We started making roads a bigger priority that, uh, that mitigated the decrease and got us nearly to the point where we're putting roads uh, together faster than they fall apart. Uh, I think that's uh, that's the, the appropriate goal for lawmakers, but they were able to use the growth of the state budget to make roads a priority. And the uh, uh, more resources is something that is translated uh, to today as well. I think Bob covered some of these numbers. My measures are a little bit different. It's not just general fund and school aid fund. It's all of the money from the state's taxes and fees that gets appropriated in the budget. Uh, each year, and as you can see, uh, we did take a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a of a hit in 2000s. That was more than supplemented by federal spending. Uh, that's increased uh, last year, and, and again this year, and it's projected to continue into the future. So we've got more money to spend on our priorities. In addition to this, again, as Bob covered, and I think that's really all the uh, all the charts that I need to show for you right now, but. Um, uh, as, as you can see, we have more money to accomplish priorities if, if we make them. Uh, despite the fact that Michigan is down over 150,000 jobs since the pandemic began, state revenue is well above pre-pandemic levels. 
Um, in addition to that, we've got fund balance that, that Bob did a good job of covering, and we've got extra unallocated federal, uh, 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 federal transfers. I mean, last year was kind of crazy how much money we got from the federal government. And I want to dwell on that because they, Congress gave us huge, largely unrestricted transfers uh, because they said uh, our revenue was down and we faced a lot of extraordinary, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary needs. We needed the money, except that we didn't. State revenue actually increased. Uh, in fact, Michigan wasn't alone. Most state revenues increased at that, had increased at that point. And if there were extraordinary needs, uh, they were not extraordinary, uh, extraordinary enough to get bipartisan approval. Again, Michigan has $6 billion in unallocated federal transfers. I mean, the nation went further into record levels of debt for nothing. Congress is weird and I don't like it. Um, so federal lawmakers, I wanted to talk about one other thing because it's, it has come up in the tax policy debate is that uh, Congress did attract a string that says that the, this money cannot be used directly or indirectly to reduce taxes. And what they meant per treasury uh, rules is that it can't uh, be used to lower state revenue below inflation. And well, there's a major problem with the way that the treasury calculates that because you're not going to know whether you're above or below the limits until the year is over. I mean, who among us right now is confident about their inflation expectations? Um, but the bigger problem is that the string is unconstitutional, and that's not me just opining. I mean, there are cases involving 20 other states in the courts right now. Um, with every ruling on the question of whether this, uh, uh, this string is constitutional falling on, in favor of the tax cutters. Now, that also includes one in Kentucky, and a Sixth Circuit appeal there would apply to Michigan. So we will get clarification soon on uh, whether that restriction is binding. But um, I wanted to cover some of these budget trends because, again, the biggest obstacle to or the biggest objection being raised to tax cuts is whether the state can afford it. States have to balance their budgets, so reduced revenue uh, either has to reduce the growth of state spending or require budget cuts. And with, spend, uh, with revenue being up and with a lot of cash at lawmakers' disposal, it's no wonder that there's interest from lawmakers in tax cuts. How much more money do lawmakers need before they think tax cuts are affordable? Now, I do want to talk about tax uh, policy. Tax rate reductions have their virtues. They encourage job growth and they, state, uh, and they make the state more competitive. And I'm sure Janelle is going to cover the more than a dozen states that have cut their taxes over the past year, including some of our neighbors. I mean, Ohio now taxes income at lower rates than Michigan. But the lawmakers in those other states faced similar dynamics to the ones that uh, we face here in Michigan, and they passed important rate reductions. Now, uh, letting people keep a greater percentage of what they earn is a tried and true way, a true way to encourage job growth. Michigan is 14th in, uh, worst uh, um, in its job recovery, and 10 states have already uh, added more jobs than they lost during the pandemic. Um, the state could use the boost that tax cuts provide. And it's also understandable that some residents are still upset by the 2007 income tax uh, rate increases, which were supposed to be temporary but canceled in 2011. Now, tax rates matter. They matter to business expansion. They matter to the long-term economic decisions we make. And they matter to the state's long-term economic growth. But there were other things in the, uh, in the bill that the governor vetoed too. So let's talk about them. Uh, in addition to rate cuts, there were child tax credits and a boost to senior exemptions. Now, I can't read legislators' minds, but both pieces look like a strategic response to the governor's own proposals for pension exemptions and the earned income tax credit. Now, pension exemptions are generally bad policy. We should not give tax preferences to some form of retirement income, but not others. And I think the governor would probably agree, but like I said, I'm not a mind reader. So what legislators did was lower the age of persons eligible for the senior exemption and increase the size of that exemption. Maybe that's the policy they'd land on if they agreed to, uh, agreed to do something uh, to increase favoritism for senior income, I'm not sure. Now, child tax credits also stand to be something similar to the earned in income tax credit. As Rachel showed, you, you're eligible for a lot more if you have qualified dependents. Um, uh, so, uh, there are major differences. Child tax credits, everyone's eligible. They're, they're not subject to income, uh, income uh, uh, restraints. 
So they applied to a lot more people. The version they also passed was odd because it was non-refundable. So I guess if you qualify for it, make sure you plan your taxes out so that you're eligible for it. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird policy if you're going to offer child tax credits in the first place. But um, those competing ideas are both a response to like this, this part of the tax politics game that I just don't like, which is for some people, the only thing that matters about a tax cut is how much a preferred household stands to gain. And under uh, both the child tax credit and the EITC, you can affect those numbers. And they wind up being very, very similar. So the EITC, if you had just one child eligible for it, under the governor's proposal, you get um, uh, $507 max credits, which is really close to what you would get with the child tax credit. For two children, you'd get $837. So again, those are pretty close. So this is just another way of saying that despite veto threats, the legislature and the governor seem to be closer than they would appear by the rhetoric that they're using. There should be room to negotiate over, over these policies uh, if they're willing to negotiate. And in fact, there's two big issues that I think um, uh, they think you can negotiate over. The governor doesn't want a rate cut and she wants the reforms to be phased in over time. The legislature wants a rate cut and they want those tax cuts to happen yesterday. And I mean that quite literally. Under the bill that they approved, the tax hikes would have gone in place at the start of the year. So uh, it's just another way of saying uh, if there's room for compromise, if tax cuts are a priority, just like everything else in fiscal policy, can we afford a tax cut? Yes, absolutely. We've, we've afforded to operate on less. Are there consequences to a tax cut? Yes, also, obviously. Um, what those consequences will be will depend on what they agree to and upon subsequent budget negotiations. It can be a slowing of revenue growth or it can be actual cuts. And frankly, there are a lot of places in, uh, where I would love to see reduce or reductions in state spending. The state has uh, business subsidy programs that are ineffective at creating jobs, unfair to the businesses who don't get them, and expensive to the state budget. And instead of arguing about what, uh, how much to give the next big company when they threaten to go elsewhere, without a handout, states should agree with each other to stop awarding selective preferences. And in fact, there's bipartisan legislation introduced that would start that process too. And, and maybe a tighter budget would help lawmakers see that they ought to stop playing the corporate handout game. But anyway, tax cuts are affordable if they're a priority. Every budget is about balancing multiple demands. Compromises get revisited, assumptions get reassessed, new preferences come to light, and old preferences are disregarded, which is, again, my respectful criticism of, uh, of, of Bob's uh, point about baseline budgets. There is no status quo budget. We have to negotiate these things every year. We have to, we, we have to talk about these things. But anyway, that's, that's my point. Um, budgets are always about priorities. Uh, there's, there's money for tax cuts if it's a priority, and it clearly is for a majority of legislators right now. Rates matter, and the vetoed bill includes a rate cut. There is room for negotiation, and that's going to be one of the key issues. And lawmakers um, may be closer than you expect to reaching a compromise, but it's not clear they get, they're get they going to get there. There's a lot of political points to be made between here and the election, but I would love to congratulate the governor for passing a bipartisan compromise tax cut that reduces taxes on everyone. Uh, we'll see if that Thank happens. Thank you, James. Uh, appreciate that viewpoint. And uh, we did do a uh, forum earlier this year and had uh, your colleague, uh, Michael Lefebvre, talk about um, economic development incentives and their uses by state. So um, I'm sure that will be an ongoing discussion as well. But again, appreciate, uh, appreciate your sharing your perspective with us here today. And as James noted, our final speaker is uh, Janelle Kamenga from the Tax Foundation. Uh, Janelle, several other states are facing a similar situation in Michigan with uh, a surplus of general fund and are considering uh, cutting taxes themselves. What are, what are other states across the country uh, in this position uh, taking a look at? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question because there's a lot of action happening. And I think it's really good to put Michigan reforms in context of other states. So if you'll forgive me one second, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And let me turn that into a presentation here. 
All right, so I was going to introduce myself, but I don't think that's necessary because we're short on time here. But uh, 2021 was a huge year for tax cuts. I know that we're talking about the current landscape, but I think uh, putting it in context of last year as well is really important. Uh, 13 states either reduced their corporate or individual income taxes or you can see on this map here. Uh, which we put out on July 14 is actually missing a few states, uh, North Carolina and Arkansas, uh, also enacted reforms after the map was made. So that's important to note. Uh, I won't run through all the tax changes that happened in 2021, but I'll highlight just a few uh, because I think it's important to realize that states aren't just cutting top rates. Uh, many are also consolidating their brackets in order to make their tax codes simpler and less distorted for residents. Uh, so in Idaho, you can see that they changed the uh, top rate for individual income taxes from 6.925 to 6.5, and they also consolidated some brackets. And uh, then in Louisiana, which I was uh, somewhat involved in, uh, they did uh, similarly, at least on the corporate income tax side, in terms of consolidating brackets and bringing rates down. On the individual income tax, they didn't consolidate any brackets, but they did bring down the rates pretty significantly, and they created a new uh, rate cap as well in the Constitution. Uh, Louisiana is interesting to note because they made this change revenue neutral because they had a, a rare uh, deduction, which was a deduction for federal income taxes paid, uh, which is kind of like the opposite of the state and local tax deduction. Uh, where they got to uh, take away from their income taxes, whatever they paid in federal income taxes. Sounds like a great idea, but it ended up being pretty distortive because uh, if something's uh, favored on the federal side, that means that it actually increases your state uh, tax liability. So they ended up taking away that deduction entirely and just bringing down rates instead to make the tax code uh, more simple. Also, as James mentioned, and I forgot to put this on here, but Ohio did uh, bring down its rates, uh, its top rate lowered from 4.797% to 3.99%, which is a significant improvement. And then that next bracket is 3% across the board. And they made that retroactive to January 1 of 2021. Uh, one second, my computer's not going. Okay, so when we uh, think of how 2020, sorry. Uh, when we think of how 2020 started out, uh, this, uh, this breadth and depth of tax reform would be uh, an unexpected development. Uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, state and local governments were understandably concerned as to whether they could last through a global pandemic and the related shutdowns, but federal assistance and the lifting of lockdown restrictions allowed the economy to bounce back, and most states uh, ended fiscal year 2021 flush with cash. And while a lot of that state money was one-time funds from the federal government, uh, much of the revenue growth that states have seen has been organic, and it has come from taxes and other revenue of their own sources. And the states that ended up cutting taxes in 2021 did see large revenue growth between fiscal years 2019 and 2020, as you can see in this chart here. Uh, the largest increase was by far Idaho, which saw a 35% increase, and the smallest was Oklahoma with a 5% increase. Uh, now this financial this uh, financial situation explains why states were able to cut taxes, but the last few years have also given states a lot more motivation to actually cut those taxes and want to improve. Uh, because the world is a lot more mobile than it once was, and now that employers and employees have realized that the physical offices aren't as important as they once thought, uh, there's no putting that remote work genie back in the bottle. Uh, some industries obviously still require on-site work, but as a whole, the workforce has far more flexibility to live where they want to live rather than just where jobs dictate that they have to live. Uh, and people have been taking advantage of this newfound freedom. As you can see on this map of migration, uh, the pattern is pretty clear. People are leaving high tax, high cost states in favor of lower tax, lower cost alternatives. Uh, individual income taxes are just one component of overall tax burdens, and, but they do matter and they can provide a useful comparison. Uh, so if we include Washington, D.C., then in the top one third of states for population growth since the start of the pandemic, uh, so that's using data from April 2020 to July of 2021, uh, then the average top marginal state and local income tax rate is 3.5 percent, while in the bottom third of states, it's about 7.3 percent. Uh, people do move for a lot of reasons. Uh, sometimes taxes are expressly part of that calculation. Sometimes they only play an indirect role because they contribute to a broadly favorable economic environment. And sometimes they do play little or, little or no role. And we do understand that. We're not arguing against that. 
Uh, the census data here doesn't tell us exactly why each person moved, but there's no denying that there's a strong correlation between those low cost states and population growth. Uh, and states are uh, not ignorant of this. They've taken notice of this phenomenon and they want to be able to attract residents and businesses. Uh, that was overwhelmingly true in 2021, as we saw, but the tax cutting trend does continue in 2022. Uh, and some common themes have arisen this session. Uh, just like last year, rate reductions are at the front of lawmakers' minds, uh, especially when it comes to the individual income tax, as you'll see more in a minute when we get to talking about specific state plans. Uh, also, uh, notably, and this is new for this year, not last year, uh, five states, that's Connecticut, New Mexico, Tennessee, Washington, and West Virginia, have legislation or governor's proposal to cut sales tax rates. Uh, now, while most but not all of the proposals to cut income taxes are championed by Republicans, I think it's really noteworthy that all five serious efforts to cut sales taxes have come from Democratic lawmakers. Uh, but both Republicans and Democrats have proposed exempting groceries from sales tax bases, or at least expanding the current exemptions in Alabama, Colorado, Illinois, Kansas, and Mississippi. Uh, five states have already enacted reforms this session, and you can see those here. Uh, you'll notice that several of these, Iowa, Idaho, and Nebraska, also enacted reforms last year. So clearly lawmakers in those states aren't content to just sit on their laurels. They know that the landscape is very competitive right now, and they want to give their state the best chance that they can. Uh, so in 2021, uh, Iowa lawmakers enacted a bill to reduce the state's top individual income tax rate from 8.53% to 6.5% as of 2023. Uh, the state did have tax triggers in place uh, to lower that more, but this legislation lowered the rate manually instead of waiting for those triggers to do the job. Uh, but Iowa clearly didn't stop there. They're back again this year, and this session, uh, lawmakers passed reforms that will bring down that income tax to a flat 3.9% by tax year 2026, which is just a huge drop from where they were before. And it does create additional tax triggers that would phase down the corporate income tax uh, aiming for a rate of 5.5% there. And Idaho, like we saw last time, uh, is interested in tax reform. And this year they accomplished further rate cuts, uh, retroactively bringing the top rates for both the individual and the corporate income taxes from 6.5% to 6%. And then they consolidated some more brackets. Uh, Nebraska did take a slightly different direction from its earlier reforms earlier reforms, it's not as concerned about top rates right now, but instead it's uh, reducing its inheritance tax, which is a wise move as it's one of only six states to still levy one. Uh, and as I mentioned before, New Mexico uh, will be reducing its gross receipts tax, which is the state's version of a sales tax uh, from 5.125% to 5%. Uh, it's the first sales tax rate reduction the state has seen in the last 40 years. So definitely noteworthy. And then uh, lawmakers in Utah did decide to cut rates from 4.95 to 4.85% for both the corporate and individual income taxes. Uh, so those are just the states that have already enacted legislation. Plenty of states are on the move, uh, mostly falling into the main categories that we mentioned before uh, with those rate reductions and sales tax uh, considerations. Uh, there are several states worth watching that are still in the process of thinking about reforms. Uh, Georgia is thinking about consolidating and lowering their income tax to be a, a flat 5.25% and also raising their personal exemption to uh, uh, stop any problems for lower income folks seeing that flat tax. Uh, Nebraska is, well, I mean, they were already looking at uh, reducing that inheritance tax, but they had the potential to actually eliminate it entirely. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Kentucky is looking at a phase out of their income tax. Uh, they're also looking at some sales tax base broadening in order to help pay for that. Uh, Ohio uh, has a potential repeal of their commercial activities tax, which is called the CAT, uh, which is their gross receipts tax. Uh, at the Tax Foundation, we're very familiar with these because we think of them as very uh, economically damaging taxes because they really do tax business inputs. They lead to a lot of tax pyramiding that gets passed on to consumers. Uh, so uh, any reduction in that would be uh, very good for the state. Uh, it would cut back the base 20% over five years uh, for a total phase at the end of those five years. Uh, it's early in the process and likely it's more of a long-term change, but it's really important to note that that conversation has started and the ball is rolling for that. Uh, Oklahoma also has uh, a big package of bills to try and uh, fix a number of structural issues in the corporate income tax. They're also looking at repealing their franchise tax and making their income tax into a flat tax. Uh, Massachusetts is looking at their estate tax. Uh, on the opposite side, they're thinking about digital advertising taxes, which are not uh, in their favor, but they are thinking about those. 
and they also have a graduated income tax on the ballot in November. So also kind of in the opposite uh, direction of some states, but uh, worth watching. Uh, Mississippi is also thinking about income tax reductions and or repeal, but there are some continuing plans but we will definitely be watching. The so states are clearly conscious changes and they're, uh, at least in Louisiana, I talked with a, a bunch of legislators the other week and they're just asking me what Mississippi's doing. So clearly they're, they're worried and they're worried about staying. So uh, in order they land in we look at five different categories. We look at this, uh, their sales taxes, property taxes, and unemployment insurance taxes. Look at a bunch of variables in those categories, and then we rank them from one to 50, from best to worst. So as you can see on this map here, uh, a lot of the uh, top 10 have things in common. Uh, most of them are missing taxes. Uh, but uh, Indiana and Utah have all of the major taxes, but they still score very well because they have uh, low rates on very broad bases. So uh, yeah, this is one way that we can compare between states and often uh, states use this as kind of a jumping off point of where they can improve and uh, what things that uh, we can help them with. Uh, so uh, it's worth noting that uh, had, or I mean, if the uh, Michigan bill actually makes it across the finish line and had it uh, passed and been in effect immediately, then uh, Michigan would have ranked eighth instead of 12th on here, which is a significant improvement. It would uh, have brought the state into the top 10. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll keep watching to see what uh, actually ends up happening in Michigan. But uh, yeah, we'll see on that. Uh, so in summary, there's a lot of movement on the, the state tax policy front. States are definitely concerned as to how they stack up and how attractive they are to do a business and resident growth. And they're willing to change their tax codes to make a difference there. Uh, because the tax, the uh, tax landscape is moving so much right now, if states are not moving forward, they tend to be falling behind. So that is what I have to share with you today. I'll turn it back to Arnold. Thank you very much, Janelle. I appreciate that. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, that last slide that uh, certainly over the course of time, it seems to me that Michigan has certainly improved its business tax climate. I remember when we were in the ranked in the 20th or 30th, and that now we're up to 12, that, that's pretty good. And it's interesting to note that as that has gotten better, our per capita income has dropped. So I don't know what the correlation is between that. I'm not an economist, but uh, it seems as our business tax climate has improved, our per capita income has gone down. So um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I think we're 34th now in per capita income. So it's not, it seems to me that it's not always the case that, uh, you know, a bit, uh, improving business tax climate will improve the overall welfare of, 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 of the state in terms of in terms of per capita income. There are many variables, of course, that go in go into both. But I, I want to thank each and every one of you for your perspectives today. Um, certainly, this is an ongoing conversation over the next few months as uh, the legislature and governor hope to wrap up the budget discussions by June 30th, and uh, certainly interesting to watch discussions these days center around a surplus of funds as compared to um, a, a deficit of funding. One of the few times uh, that I can remember since I've been involved in Michigan politics and policy that uh, we've had this situation. Uh, I, uh, the questions have been answered uh, in the Q&A box, and I greatly appreciate that. Um, if there are no other questions uh, for today, I want to thank uh, all of our speakers for their presentations. They will be posted to the IPSER website, as will a recording of uh, today's session. And as Matt noted, uh, we'll be back in May with a, another public policy forum on refugee resettlement, uh, especially as it concerns uh, the current uh, war in Ukraine and uh, former refugees uh, uh, from uh, Afghanistan as well, and how does that impact state policy and what state policy tries to do to help uh, those refugees. Uh, so again, thank you very much. If you haven't purchased a ticket yet to our Michigan Political Leadership Annual Dinner on April 20th, we'd be grateful if you did so. That'll be taking place here in Lansing. Again, thank you to all our speakers and for those of us who joined us today. Have a great day.